This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 1550, Off the Racks. I'm Brian Christman. I'm Shane Kelly. I'm Adam Murdo. And I'm Chris Everly. And welcome to the show. This is our Off the Racks episode where we we have these to sort of get some recent comics discussion going on. Mm -hmm. Um, We're a little bit behind this time. Yeah, yeah, well, okay. That's what I was going to get at. We we pick uh, usually about three issues from a previews uh, and, you know, read them and talk about them. And we're actually a little behind these these, these um, issues. I guess came out in February. Feb- yes, February. So we're a little behind, but you know, uh, you know, things happened in March. You know, London and tenth anniversary stuff. Let's go with winter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that winter. <laughs> so in this episode, we're going to be discussing, and you know, as usual, detail spoilers. Forewarned is forearmed uh, from DC Multiversity Mastermen Number One. From Marvel, Spider Gwen number one, and from help me out here, Secret Identities. Secret Identities from Image. From Image, okay. Secret Identities number one from Image. But before we get into all the fun and frolic, a word from our sponsors. This episode of Comic Geek Speak is brought to you by SuperheroStuff.com. We can go to for all of your superhero stuff. <laughs> yeah, really ah, good. he was right on cue there. Very well, I sort of paused dramatically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, they've got everything for your for your the geek purchaser and you. You know, t-shirts, hats, hoodies, PJs and undies, belts, accessories, home office, all kinds of stuff. They have right now an Avengers Age of Ultron shop. Nice, all kinds of merchandise from that. They've got a section just for Daredevil because, of course, the new Daredevil. as you record this, we're mere hours away from the release of uh, Daredevil on Netflix. Does that go up at midnight? That goes up at 12.01, right. sir. Excellent. <laughs> I won't be up that late watching the no, first episode. Either. but we'll, we'll Actually, there's a little teal that'll be an upcoming episode. We'll talk about some of the Daredevil. Yeah. But, yeah, superhero stuff also has all kinds of coupons and sales going on. So check out their website. Uh, subscribe to their newsletter. Follow them on, on uh, Facebook and, and yeah. Twitter. They're actually going to, I believe, uh, a couple of conventions this year. I think they're actually down uh, at MegaCon this week as we record okay, this. Okay, good. Uh, they're actually local to us here, mm-hmm. not too far away. We know, we know a lot, quite a few people Quite a few there. folks who work for them. They're, they're good stuff. And if you're looking for anything geek-related, this is a good place to go. Not just superheroes. They've yeah. got, of course... Doctor Who, oh, yeah. Star Wars, Star Trek. They've all got kinds it all. of pop, col- pop culture paraphernalia. Yep. So check them out at SuperheroStuff.com. You can go to for all of your Superhero, superhero Stuff. stuff. Yes. Oh, <laughs> all right. And this episode is also brought to you by Scribd. Scribd is like Netflix. Get it? Netflix on the segue here. Good segue. For comics. Uh, with a subscription, you'll get access to more than 10,000 comics from Marvel, IDW Top Shelf, Valiant, Dynamite, Archie, and more. They're the only subscription service that gives you that variety all for one monthly price. On top of that, you'll also get unlimited access to their huge library of ebooks and audiobooks. More than one million titles altogether, all available anytime, anywhere. So head over to scribd.com slash comic geek speak to get started with a free month. Even more importantly, Scribd makes sure you can find your way to comics and books you're going to love. They've got hundreds of collections curated by their team of editors. And as you read, they'll tailor recommendations for you based on other titles you loved you know, or not. So go to scribd.com slash comic geek speak right now and they'll set you up with a free month to get started. That's 30 days of unlimited reading and you'll be supporting this show. So it's a win win situation. That's S C R I B D dot com slash comic geek speak. All right. Well, before we get too far ahead, Shane and 
Chris, you guys unfortunately missed our previous episode. Yes. Um, did you have anything that you saw in there you wanted to see if we didn't talk about or mention, let everyone know about at all? No, not off the top of my head. Um, th- this was the, this is my strange my strange new experiment month, and uh, I got my order down to fifty five dollars. Which, We've usually been what twice that. Oh yeah, easily. <laughs> and I and 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 I checked the records. That's the that I've never had an order that low ever. Wow. Ever. Uh, since I've been ordering from DCBS, so no, nothing jumped out specifically at me to, to mention that you guys probably didn't talk about. I didn't, I didn't even get to listen to the episode yet because I usually scroll through some of those, right? Uh, to listen, but yeah. What about you, Chris? Yeah. Admittedly, pants. I haven't even looked at the previews yet for this <gasps> month. I'm <I've been gasps> so swamped. Yeah, so that I'll I be did doing do. that in the very near future. <clears throat> okay. Well, you can listen to our episode and <laughs> well, so well, believe me, even yeah. long before I was I was a cast member. Those recordings are invaluable when it comes to, to ordering because there's always something I miss, and you guys will always highlight that, which has always been a, a, a wonderful service. Yeah. Very cool. Well, uh, this past weekend was Easter week. Everybody have a good Easter who wasn't here for the previous episode? Yeah, it was good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. Good Easter. Excellent. Um, so I went down – actually, that weekend there was a comic book convention called the Great Philadelphia Comic Con. Uh, actually, it was down in Oaks, PA, which is about – about a 40, 45 minute drive yeah. from for where I am. And I would say about halfway to Philly. So, yeah, from where we are. Sort of like the midway point ish. Pants, that's where RetroCon was held. Correct? That's correct. correct. Okay. Yeah. That's correct. Same location. I mean, not in the same hall, but it's the same location. Yeah. Uh, I was kind of going back and forth. Do I want to go? The tickets were kind of expensive, actually, for essentially first time con. I mean, yes, um, it's been sort of what used to be the great Allentown con moved to Philadelphia. Okay. All right. But they added more celebrities. Mm-hmm. I mean, they had the Power Rangers were there. Uh, J. August Richards from oh, uh, sure. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was there. And uh, uh, Angel. Yep. Uh, um, George Sakai was there on Saturday. Oh, nice. And I, I looked at it. I, I just couldn't justify it because when I go to these comic conventions where it says right there in the title, Comic Con, I'm looking for back issues or creators. Yeah. And now they did have some good creators there. Mark McKenna was there. Mike Very McCone. Nice. Brian J.L. Glass was there. And, of course, J.K. Woodward was there. I and, have to send Brian a message. I keep wanting to talk to him, and I haven't done it in so long. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, J.K. wanted to talk about his uh, new book from Monkey Brain Comics uh, coming April 15th called Behemoth. Mm-hmm. So we arranged to have me come down there and interview him in person instead of you know getting getting all the phone and all the stuff. So very cool. He got me, and I was only actually there Friday at six thirty when it was a four to nine nine o'clock show. I got down there at six thirty. The lot was pretty packed, so it was pretty well attended for a Friday. I can't really speak for Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, Sunday in particular, that being Easter. Easter Sunday. Right. I saw a few things online where to look at. There was pretty good attendance, so I think that that's a good thing, but. From my perspective, I was a little disappointed. I was looking for more, you know, back issue comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a, a dealer there who had a huge selection of discounted trades and hardcovers. I mean, huge. It was great. There were then, I, my, by my count, three other tables that had back issue comics. That was it. A lot of their toys, Lego, of the celebrities, you know, again, the artist alley section. So I was a little disappointed. I'm, I'm, I'm happy I was only there for a few hours and J.K. got me until we could chat about his yeah. book. Um, and one of the tables, which I th- I'm not sure who it was run by, um, they were dozens and dozens of long boxes and the books weren't in alphabetical order. Oh. Uh- uh, <laughs> uh, so I just I, I, I that drives me nuts. I just walk past it, but then not worth the time. Well, but then it got to be a little later, and it's like it's like seven thirty, and it's like I mean I'm gonna talk to JK like around eight thirty, about an hour. I got let me just look through the boxes because I got nothing else to do. There's no other comic books here. Yeah, they were essentially all dollar books. Virtually not much in any kind of order. At all so I started going through them. I'm glad I did. Because I found a couple of gems in there from my yeah. perspective. So if you could indulge me for them, because I uh, of course. always love talking about backers. So I found four oh issues, God. 12, 13, 14, and 15 of Marvel team-up I didn't have. Wow. Nice. Spider-Man, Werewolf, Cap, Submariner, and Ghost Rider. Nice. Uh, World's Those Fun- were only a dollar a piece? dollar a piece. And again, you're in pretty good shape. Nice. A Cu- couple of World's Finest issues, a Daredevil issue, House of Mystery number 300, Michael Kaluta cover. Nice. Uh, the second to last issue of House to Mystery. Yeah. 
that was all that I had on my list that I found. I actually went off my list for some oh, books. I, I, that's the list, dangerous. Ladies and gentlemen, he I, went off I went, the list. I went off the list. And luckily, no duplicates. That, I always get duplicates when I go off my list. <laughs> first issue... First issue special from the Bronze Age number six. Welcome to Dingbats of Danger Street with a Jack wow. Kirby cover. <laughs> I didn't have it. Wow. Um, one of the Red Sonia number ones from I guess like the early eighties, a dollar cover. Okay. I'm not sure who did that. The this caught my eye because it's recently solicited by Mark Wade with uh, Dynamite Entertainment. Justice Inc. number oh. one. Wow. Right, so that is the issue that uh, the cup, the Alex Ross cover of the new yes. Justice Inc. number one was this, based on. And it just had the Joe Kubert cover. Nice. So I got that for a dollar. I got something I couldn't find in my database. The Amazing Spider-Man with a Goblin cover story that was free with a purchase of AIM toothpaste. Nice. Huh. Promotional. I, I've seen that, yeah. I've seen it before, but I couldn't find it in my database. Uh... A reprint issue. It's actually the Trigger Twins number one. <laughs> it reprints some other story, but it's actually from the Bronze Age. Right. The Bronze Age, I guess, from like the mid seventies. Jonah Hex number one. Wow. For a dollar. That's nice. A couple of Charlton Judo Master issues. Uh. <laughs> a Peter Cannon Thunderbolt Charlton issue. That is – in this issue, it says, T-Bolt battles in the ape arena. There's apes on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> then I've gone on and on in the past sometimes about tail enders where, like, when a book is canceled, like, the last few issues, even the last one issue, are sometimes, like, very hard oh, to yeah, find and they're more, more valuable. Yep. Sure. Star Wars, the guy Joe being examples. Yep. Well, I got the last two issues of Arak, Son of Thunder, and uh-huh. The Warlord and the, <laughs> the dollar bid. And then this thing just caught my eye. I'm not even sure I can give the title. Uh, Four Color Comics was a long-running Dell title that was like sure. a weekly comic. Had all kinds of TV shows, movies, and things, and different things throughout the 50s and 60s. Yeah. And I saw that this actually is from like 1955. Good shape. It was a dollar. The title of it, Shane, you want to read the title? Little Beaver. <laughs> <laughs> And the cover shows an American Indian child uh, ambushing a sinister-looking cowboy who's just uh, entered a barn. <laughs> I I got it from the title alone for a dollar, and <sighs> so yes, that's that's quite an impressive haul for. So a yeah, it was like that twenty twenty five dollars. So as much as I like to poo poo and buy bypass, you know, dollar bins or books that aren't at any kind of order. Yeah, if you have the there, time, yeah. you might find some things. So I was very happy with with that purchase. Well, that's there. good. And speaking of back issues, I wanted to ask – I had a, <laughs> I wanted to ask Murdoch a question. This came up on his recent uh, – well, I'll, pl- I'll play the clip for you. Listen to the clip here. Previously on Comic Geek Speak. The Crisis Tapes, Episode 12. I went to uh, the London Super Comic Convention earlier uh, – well, in, in March, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, while I was over there, I uh, met a listener from Scotland named James Richardson. Um, and uh, one of our conversations concerned uh, something that James found over there, which was uh, – Copies of the uh, monitor appearances from GI Combat. Ah. He found GI Combat number 275 over there in, in London. I mean, th- those things are hard enough to find over here in the States where they were produced. You know, they, the print runs are pretty small. And uh, I think they're pretty much universally the hardest monitor cameos to find. And James goes and digs into bins in London and happens to find them there. Yeah, I certainly don't have that GI Combat one. I've never seen it. Um... I think I, I lie. I think I might have seen the monitor image online somewhere from that particular issue, but I've never held it in my hands. Yep, no, I cannot claim to have done that either. So yet neither one of us have had that pleasure. So let me get this straight. He found the issue at the London Convention when you're there and didn't even show it to you to let you hold it in your hands? <laughs> I, I, I didn't really ask him to uh, show it to me or let me hold oh, it in my hands. Up. So he just taught you, said, like, neener, neener, boo-boo, that kind of it, thing? It, no, he did not say neener, <laughs> neener, boo-boo. He certainly did not say those words or anything to those. He just said, hey, I guess what I found. And I, 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 I didn't see. I mean, he, he might have been fibbing, I suppose. But oh, okay. I, 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 I doubt that he was. And he knew yeah. you didn't have it? No, I, I don't think you – I've read it. That, that's the only thing that matters. Oh, because you read the, the PDF copy. Right, right, which uh, you know, David Akers out in Washington uh, produced for me. He right. scanned his copy and sent it to me so that I could read it for the crisis tapes. Right. Nice. I'm um, grateful to him for that. Look between your manila folders there to your left. 
<laughs> Look under your seat. <laughs> <laughs> This is, the, well, speak, speak. this is the Oprah moment. Yes, now I am holding in my hands a copy of G.I. Combat number 270. <laughs> Did you find it down there? I found it oh the same place for a dollar. Oh, wow. Wow. For a dollar. <laughs> That's ah. great. All right, I'm opening it. Well, I know. Hold it in your hands, for God's sake. I saw that and I plotted. Like, oh, my God. I, I couldn't believe I found that down there. <laughs> All right, let's see if... Uh, it's the second and third page. That's awesome. Monitor meets... Jibs. Well, it's right there. It's like, well, I don't think he's. It's. That. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, this is the one where the uh, where the ghost of Jib Stewart just uh, encounters the monitor's satellite as opposed to the monitor himself. Right. Uh, but there's another issue uh, where uh, we we actually it's the first published full frontal image of the monitor. You know, previously, well, prior to that, he'd been seen only from behind or sitting in a right. chair, and all you yeah. saw was his hand sure. gesturing, or he'd full be in shadow. Monitor. Wow. <laughs> Full frontal clothed monitor, yeah. Now, do you have that appearance? Uh, no. Oh, uh, so another one. That's 274, I think. Now, what's on the back of that issue, though? Uh, well, it's an ad for the Ghostbusters uh, Activision game. <laughs> <laughs> A great ad on the back to yeah. boot. For your Commodore 64. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, yeah, I knew you needed that. I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe I found I can't believe you found that. <laughs> All right. Well, that's my back issue talk for this that's episode. Great. That, that's that's a good that's day's talk, man. Yes. So now I will be your narrator for the rest of the episode here. Uh, Chris actually has to leave in a little while, so we're trying to get some other issues out of the way first. Um, dealer's choice. Spider-Gwen or Multiversity first? Which should we do? Do Spider-Gwen first. Spider-Gwen? Okay. I will read the original solicit for Spider-Gwen number one. Okie dokie. Spider-Gwen. Spider-Gwen number one, written by Jason Latour. Art by Robbie Rodriguez. Spider-Gwen spins into her own series because you demanded it. The breakout hit of the biggest spider event of the century is taking comic shops by storm this winter with her own ongoing, with her own new ongoing series, Spider-Gwen. Gwen Stacy is Spider-Woman, but you knew that already. What you don't know is what friends and foes are waiting for her in the aftermath of Oh, boy. What you don't know is what friends and foes are waiting for her in the aftermath of Spider-Verse. From the fan-favorite creative team that brought you Spider-Gwen's origin story in Edge of Spider-Verse, Jason Latour, and Robbie Rodriguez. 32 pages, three ninety-nine. All right. Who got – start with your uh, initial thoughts. Uh, well, your, your uh, bi-barrel pants I'm going to do a, a, a split one oh, again because I'm, I'm weird. You are weird. Um, if it's just me, a borrow. If it's uh, – if I had a daughter – or somebody uh, like like maybe one of Shauna's girls, I'd give it a buy. Uh, for me, it's a definite borrow. Uh, it's a borrow for me as well. All right, I, uh, I I'll go first. I I read it. I liked it. I thought the art was pretty good. Um, I did not read my Spider Verse issues yet, so I came into this kind of cold, knowing okay. knowing that she spins out of Spider Verse and all that. Um, but I enjoyed the story well enough. Not enough that I would buy it every month. It 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 seemed written for a a younger age to me, not something that I would necessarily follow. Um, but if somebody said, "Hey, do you have this? Can I borrow it?" I'd say, "Sure, here. It's worth a read." Now, if you have a daughter or a niece or a you know younger girl in your life, and you're looking to give them something that they could read and get into comics, or that they already read comics and they just want a female. Uh, hero to kind of follow, I think it's worth buying for them to read. Um, I think the story went along well enough that they'd understand it. I think it's adventurous enough for them. I don't think there's enough female heroes of a younger age. You have now, like Batgirl, with the way she's drawn and, and written a little bit, I think. You have, uh, what, Ms. Marvel? And Spider-Gwen are, are, are three mainstream Marvel or DC characters that I think you could give to a young lady and say, here, read this. I think you'll enjoy it. I think it. I think it does a good job on that level. So that's why I gave it my split little. For me, it's a borrow, but I really think it would it would be a, a good book to give to a a young lady or your daughter or something if you wanted to have them follow a female superhero if they were interested. Okay, so now you didn't read the Spider Verse. Verse. No. So can somebody answer for me, Gwen Stacy? Is this an alternate universe? Yes. Oh, it is. Okay. It is definitely. Well, well, 
the real Gwen – well, the Earth-616 uh, Gwen Stacy is dead. Yeah. Well, I, I mean I know that, but I Continues just... to be dead. Mm. So this is Con- like – Okay, continues to be dead. Yes. This isn't timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly. This is alternate okay. universe. Well, it is still well, kind of timey-wimey time. because yeah, when you're is. talking about Marvel Universe alternate realities – They are kind of timey-wimey. Right. It's, it's uh, like traveling sideways in time when yeah. you're going to alternate worlds in the Marvel Universe as opposed to DC where – it's all physical worlds that have a physical existence in the same physical space, yeah. and you're really traveling through space to go from parallel Earth to parallel Earth, whereas in Marvel, it's more like time travel. Okay, since I've already started so, babbling. Uh, no, that, that's fine. <laughs> but, I mean, and that's all I had to say. It, it, it was a good enough issue. I enjoyed it. But like I said, I, I think it would be great for, for a young girl who wants to read some female superhero characters. I think this would do a good job. All uh, right. So, yes. Um, yeah, you, you surmised cor- uh, correctly, Brian. This is uh, taking place in one of Marvel's parallel universes, well, alternate realities. Mm-hmm. That's, that's really the Marvel term, um, which is kind of funny and maybe even a little ironic uh, that uh, Marvel is launching an alternate reality series at about the same time this Secret Wars event is looming, which mm-hmm. uh, you know, purportedly or, or presum- presumably perhaps is going to uh, you know, whittle down the number of alternate realities that Marvel has. But uh, you know, money talks, and apparently there was enough ground swell support for uh, this particular character that came out of the massive, uh, very much uh, alternate reality-oriented uh, Spider-Verse crossover of this past fall that they decided that even the you know, even if that is what Secret Wars is going to do, uh, this is one alternate reality that they can spare because it stands to be profitable. So anyway, uh, Spider-Gwen, I uh, love the cover, first of all. Very mm-hmm. colorful. Yeah, very uh, much Just so. uh, the way those... Uh, skyscrapers kind of emerge in these bold shafts of color out of the negative space of the background. It's, it's, it is worthy of Matisse, really, and, it's a, and then uh, Spider-Gwen herself crouching in the foreground. It's a, it reminds me of a, a vividly painted Easter egg, so I, I saved this to read on Easter afternoon. Nice. Fittingly enough. Uh, interior art uh, hasn't grown on me in quite the same way as the cover, even though it uh, seems to have been produced by they're, – they're both by Robbie Rodriguez. Uh, yeah, the, the interior pages are a little too impressionist for me. Uh, uh, remember, uh, Pants, what's the name of that uh, She-Hulk artist that uh, rubbed so many people the wrong way with uh, you know, taking so many liberties I with anatomy? I believe Javier Polito. Really? Because yeah, yeah, that, that guy has been around since the 90s. Well, he's of course, I'm checking her now. Away. Yeah, he's really altered his style if that was. Javier Polito, but anyway, the, the, this artwork doesn't go quite as far as that as those She-Hulk pages, some of which I've seen, which make you know everybody look like Mister Fantastic. That's how distorted their anatomies tend to be. A uh, little of that going on here, but not quite as offensive. It's, it's uh, suffice to say, not really my cup of tea art-wise. Uh, now, story-wise. Um, so we've got uh, an alternate reality, Gwen Stacy, from a world in which uh, she gained the spider powers instead of Peter Parker, and uh, Peter Parker died a tragic early death instead of her. So their, their fates have been kind of flip-flopped in this uh, parallel world. And uh, so what we're seeing here is a, a sort of redemption for uh, what is probably the most – Vividly remembered and therefore most influential example of what uh, Gail Simone has termed girls in refrigerators in all of comics history. You know, a female character in comics, uh, particularly a, a female supporting character uh, who um, dies a grisly death as a res- just a, uh, for the sake of melodrama and uh, to give a male hero something to grieve about. Now, so uh, someone has flung the refrigerator door open and uh, given Gwen Stacy a second chance to show us. You know, some of those proponent strengths that uh, Gwen Stacy evinced as a character even back in the 60s and 70s. Um, Here she gets not only a second chance at life, but she gets the power to back up those character strengths that she showed. Uh, You know, she was always a smart, strong-willed individual, but now she's got the spider powers to go with that, and uh, she can be truly proactive. And uh, now all of this coming in the age of uh, Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone, too. So we've... Gwen Stacy's got a lot of fans out there now thanks to those amazing Spider-Man movies, and Spider-Gwen is here to help uh, capitalize on that. Uh, who It should be mentioned is – the, the name of the character is actually Spider-Woman inside the pages of the series. Yeah. But uh, I think it's actually kind of a good idea to call the series what it's called, Spider-Gwen, because – I mean it, it's – it's a little bit awkward as a title, but it's functional. It avoids burying the lead in the way a more elegant but less descriptive title like a Spider Woman or Spider Girl would have. Uh, it lets people know that, hey, this is Gwen Stacy, alive and well and super-powered, getting another chance to prove what she's made of in another reality where things happened a little hap- more happily for her. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad that they went with the title that they did. 
Um, although it is a little bit odd. And again, this is not necessarily a, a bad creative decision on the creator's part, but it just struck me as a little strange that uh, if they're going out of their way to emphasize who is underneath the Spider-Woman costume in this series – uh, as opposed to her costumed identity herself. you know, This is Gwen Stacy, and they're hitting you over the head with that. In the issue itself, you don't see Gwen as Gwen for more than like a page and a half. Yeah, So you don't really see that much of Gwen Stacy being Gwen Stacy. She's just uh, crawling around doing the spider thing, and she doesn't really interact with any of her supporting cast, although they are present in force in a big way. You know, we see some scenes with uh, her father, uh, Police Captain George Stacy, who is also still alive in this parallel universe. Uh, we see Foggy Nelson. We see <laughs> uh, Frank Castle, who is a cop and an interrogator at that, uh, working over the rhino. And we see, in particular, um, one major difference between uh, Spider-Gwen's reality and Spider-Man's reality, uh, the band that Gwen belongs to and has recently quit, the Mary Janes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> M-E-R-R-Y or M-A-R-Y? M-A. Okay. Yes, they've just had a big hit with Face It Tiger. <laughs> they've gone viral with that. Yeah. And they apparently they, some, they actually got some musicians to record a version of this song that can be listened to someplace. Oh, really? Oh. I have not sought it out. I have not sought that out. Face It Tiger. <laughs> So, yeah, we get some scenes of uh, major drama-rama. We have Mary Jane Watson is herself is the lead singer here, and she's sort of a prima donna, and she's you know, just uh, whining and complaining about how everyone is working against her dreams, and she's not, she'll never be a, an online singing sensation if, if things keep on going as they're going, and she's desperate to get Gwen back as the – Gwen plays drums, apparently, in this reality. And, and she's just a, a whiny, self-centered little – Pratt in this book, and she was pretty obnoxious to me, but I'm somewhat gratified that the other characters in the story, like her fellow members of the band, find her just as obnoxious as I did. And it really, the characterization does kind of work for Mary Jane. I, 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 I'm I sorry to interrupt, but I do love the little quip in the middle of the, the – it's literally in the middle of the book where they make reference to trying to get the male drummer in and they say, what, Jim in the holograms is a possible name. I just yeah. – I laughed. Because there's this replacement drummer's name Jim. Yeah, that's, that, that is a good pun. It was funny. Yeah. Yeah, don't don't worry about interrupting, Shane. I'm going to be babbling like this for a little while to come here. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the supporting cast um, may grate on me a little bit, and uh, we don't actually get to see Gwen interacting with them. So that's that's a, maybe a little bit of a disappointment. But again, we we got to make room for action and establish uh, Gwen as as hero here, since it's a role that uh, well, readers of comics for the past several decades have not really got a chance to see her play. So we get plenty of uh, Gwen, uh, you know, crawling around and uh, pursuing the Vulture, who is the villain of the piece. Um, so this uh, alternate reality Vulture, his his visual is a little bit strange and confusing. Um, I'm not sure if the green mist that accompanies him every place is just exhaust from his the jetpack he wears. Those Vultures that follow him around, are they real? Does he have actual trained pet birds? Are they just some kind of holographic effect that he projects around himself? Or are they just something that uh, uh, Rodriguez drew in here to be for fun? Um, so, yeah, he's I'm not sure what exactly the Vulture's power set is or weaponry is here. Uh, his motivations are a tiny bit clearer. Um, <laughs> he's uh, embittered here. I, I, was, I thought I was particularly amused uh, near the end of the story when Spider-Gwen is thinking to himself about this Vulture. He's owed. He's entitled. His name belongs in lights. So it's kind of a flip-flop of the uh, generational stereotypes here that uh, a millennial hero is applying terms like entitled – you know, something that's often levied against members of the millennial generation against a supervillain who is more like a baby boomer or a, or maybe even greatest generation. Who knows how old this vulture happens to be? He looks pretty ancient. Um, so it, it's kind of a reversal of roles here, a bit of revenge that, uh, you know, the, the generation that so often, you know, accuses millennials of being entitled and self-absorbed and so, and so forth uh, is instead uh, on the receiving end of that. Um, also kind of funny, did... did uh, those of you who read the issue, uh, did you catch the uh, the dig at Ditko? No, I didn't. What was that? Uh, well, when uh, Spider Gwen goes to, in I guess I should call her Spider Woman. Uh, Spider Woman is investigating uh, the Vulture's apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, she finds this uh, uh, comic. Yeah. It, it's a Mister Z comic. I ah. missed that. Ah. Okay. <laughs> yes, as in Ditko's character, Mister A, who is basically just a mouthpiece for Ditko's objectivist uh, beliefs. And uh, then later on, when Gwen is going around uh, spray painting taunts uh, to the Vulture on the sides of buildings, you know, basically a. Uh, <laughs> vandalizing half the city to get his attention. Uh, one of her insults is, and you read terrible comics. 
<laughs> so that's uh, apparently uh, Jason Latour doesn't think that much of Ditko's uh, more recent work, and I, I can't blame him too much. It's uh, you know, too much politics and not enough actual storytelling. But anyway, um, well, Bird, when you st- when you still believe in Ayn Rand when you're in your 80s, I mean that's you know there's that, that there's a debate to be had there. <laughs> so <laughs> and probably youth versus age too, as much yeah. as anything. So. It's, it's fitting that Gwen would have that opinion. I guess it's, it's, it's true. Um, so let's see. What uh, there was some other point I wanted to make here. Um, so yeah, it's, it's 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 a fun sort of freewheeling read. Um, uh, a couple. I, I I I actually did kind of enjoy it, uh, but I don't see myself picking it up on a monthly basis for a reason similar to yours, Shane. And it's for one thing, it, it's not really aimed at us. It, this is more of a, a youth phenomenon, mm-hmm. you know, aimed at uh, what is perceived as this uh, large uh, groundswell of, of younger, probably like urban teen comic book fans, particularly female ones, sure. uh, who responded so strongly to this uh, spider-powered Gwen Stacy who had just like a kind of a, a limited appearance in the Spider-Verse crossover and reacted so positively to her, have been cosplaying her all over the place apparently. But Well, and, and, and think about it. Look at, at how everyone responded to Spider-Girl all those years ago and that series kept chugging along for quite a few many years, yeah. quite a few years. Yes, outlasted the line oh, of which yeah. it was part by a, a long a time. Yeah. Long. And that series wasn't even that good. It was Tom DeFalco writing it for crying out loud. This I respectfully disagree, brother, but continue. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I, it's, and, and I'll let you, and you, your, your voice carries more weight than mine, Chris, because I've, I, I just don't have much respect at all for DeFalco's ability as a writer and therefore read just about none of his Spider-Girl material. But um, this, 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 I, I did uh, sort of enjoy this first issue. But you know, again, it, it's not aimed at our demographic. Okay. I really see myself getting extremely annoyed with uh, the uh, the Mary Janes as a supporting cast, and just just a spider hero being part of like a Josie and the Pussycat style band. You know, it's I, I no more want to read Gwen as a part of this world than I would if Peter Parker joined like a garage band in the Earth sixteen six one six reality. Yeah. That's just not not, not a, a backdrop that I think that needs to be behind a Spider-Man story, and uh, another, another fault I would uh, another issue I'd take with this issue is that well, as, as you sort of alluded to, Shane, it's those people who did not read Spider-Verse. You know, and I know you have the issue, Shane. You just haven't read them yet, yeah. and I just stayed away from it altogether because it looked too big, too messy, and too confusing. Um, but uh, if, if you haven't read uh, this Gwen Stacy character's appearances in that story, you might find yourself a little bit at sea as you try to read this story. I, I feel like there's we, – we should know Gwen and her world a little better than we do when we uh, get around to read this issue. Um, so – yeah, and then of course there's the three ninety nine price tag. These well, are, that that hurt too. Yeah, a few strokes against it. So we have an alternate reality, but and, and for some reason Marvel alternate reality series in the Marvel multiverse don't appeal to me quite as much as the same sort of thing in the DC universe do. So that you know just it's the difference between alternate realities and parallel Earths. You know, parallel Earths just somehow seem more concrete, more significant, more real. So yeah, the fact that it's an alternate reality Spider Book, it's got kind of this uh, unrelatable to me. Uh, Urban teen milieu and uh, spinning out of this confusing crossover, and the three ninety nine price tag all adds up to my probably not picking this book up past this first issue. But I, I did kind of enjoy reading it. Um, I thought that uh, you know uh, the Bodega Bandit was a pretty awesome one off villain. Yeah, here. I, I like that too. I hope he becomes a uh, recurring villain. Actually, I think it's yeah. good that uh, Spider Woman in this reality has her own. Like a, an assortment oh, yeah. of her own villains instead of just fighting her reality's version of people sure. like the Vulture and the Rhino and, and so on and so on. And the fact that this Rhino speaks with this sort of comical Russian Boris Badenov accent, no doubt inspired by Paul Giamatti and Amazing Spider-Man yeah, I was 2. thinking that same thing. Yeah, it's a little disappointing. But yeah, so – and I'd also be kind of curious to see how uh, the relationship between Captain Stacy and Gwen unfolds in this uh, yeah, other reality. that's a bit rocky. So, so these are things that I'd be interested in seeing more of. And you know, the, the cameo by Officer Grimm is another you know, little touch. You know, I'm sure we'll be seeing plenty of uh, familiar faces mm-hmm. floating through these pages in, in future months. But And I'd, I'm interested enough in this to maybe you know, borrow someone else's copy without paying the three ninety nine just yeah. to, you know, to, to keep in. In your in, but yeah. So th- this is, as I said before, a definite borrow. An enjoyable read, but maybe just not quite solid enough or specifically appealing enough to me to want to read it monthly. Gentlemen, I had a similar um, reaction. Uh, again, I think uh, I th- what I like about this book, and what I think is actually wonderful about it, is that 
the tone of it, the voice, so to speak, is very much geared towards younger readers. And I think comics needs as much of that as humanly possible. So I, I was pleased to read that. Now, the, the caveats for me are similar to what both of you already uh, expressed, which is I, had, I did not read Spider-Verse. I knew in general what happened, but I did not read the story, so I kind of went into this cold. Um, and you know, the, the book and reading the comic, overall I enjoyed it. But it, again, it really doesn't speak to me, and I don't, I don't think – I don't mean that to think that I think the book is bad. It just, it just didn't really speak to me. Um, I thought the art was, was, was solid. I, I agree more. I thought the cover, cover was especially striking. Um, the Vulture I found enormously annoying. I thought his dialogue was very flat and uh, just had no – it was like villain of the week dialogue. So that, that, I, I was, it, that took me out of the book a little bit whenever he was, he was opening his beak, so to speak. <laughs> um, I enjoyed seeing you know, old-time Spider-Man characters like Randy Robertson, for example, and uh, you know Captain Stacy, and, and you know other Marvel characters like Foggy, and, and I, I enjoyed seeing Ben Grimm as this you know police officer who dragged himself and he fell six flights to you know to, to, to save himself, and so it was, it was it was fun to see you know classic Marvel characters being reinterpreted uh, in in this alternate reality. So overall, I, I just thought it was a fun read. It, it, I didn't. I didn't find it a, a read of great depth. You know, I, I read it very quickly. Uh, it didn't. It didn't. You know, really leave me a lot to, to think about or you know, or sort of chew over. But uh, I, I thought it was fun. And, and, and if, if Marvel's trying to reach a younger demographic, then uh, or, or and especially female readers, which is which I think is wonderful, then I, I think it's a book I would recommend. As Shane said, uh, in, in that sense, it, it's not a book. Honestly, I'm, I'm going to read again. Um, it's just it's just not really my cup of tea. Uh, I thought I, the, the the art struck me more than the writing. Uh, the writing didn't really do that much for me. I thought it was serviceable. I, I I I stayed engaged in the book, but you know, if I wasn't recording this tonight, I would have forgotten forgotten about it right as soon as I put it down, <laughs> basically. Um, and again, that's it, a lot of that's just it's, I'm just not the demographic of, of this comic, uh, at least for me. So a solid borrow and and definitely something. I I, I hope they do more books like this. Uh, that, that are going to you know try to get in those those very hard to lure in uh, younger readers. I, I echo your sentiments again. Making this book three ninety nine <laughs> again that that's going to make that endeavor all the harder in terms of getting younger people to, to read the book or to get their parents to buy it for them. In, in some cases, mm. yeah, they were smart um, enough to make Ms. Marvel two ninety nine. So why yeah. not this one? So you know, and as a little side note, this is the because Merb was kind of I. I in my shop, we because I, I only order limited copies of, of any new book we're getting in. We had sold this out before I got a chance to grab a copy, and Murd was kind enough to, to give me the digital code. So this is the first time I read a digital comic. <laughs> um, so it was that was an interesting experience. I've never done that beyond web comics, but going to the Marvel site and you know filling around with it. And I actually did the kind of the zoom in where they kind of go almost cinemat- cinematically from panel to panel, okay. almost almost giving a kind of a motion comic feel a little bit. And uh, that was interesting because I've, I've never done that. Um, so I have to admit I still enjoy I'm, – I'm terribly old-fashioned. You know, I still enjoy prefer, – I prefer to read comics literally in my hand, an actual comic book. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, was, it was an interesting perspective to, to look at a book, especially a number one issue of a character I wasn't that familiar with uh, in, in, in that new format, which is obviously very much uh, the wave of the future. Um, so it was – I don't regret reading the book. I'm glad I did, and I'm glad Marvel is trying things uh, like they did with Spider Girl. Uh, although I think Spider Girl, the first issue of Spider Girl, was far more interesting than this than this book. But um, you know, a, a solid borrow with the caveat that if you know younger readers might might definitely see this see this as a buy. All right. Uh, I guess moving on next to the Multiversity Masterman Number One. I will read the original solicit. Written by Grant Morrison, art and cover by Jim Lee and Scott Williams. Superstar writer Grant Morrison joins legendary artist Jim Lee on Earth-10 for one of the most dynamic, action-packed issues of this entire world-shattering series, The Multiversity Mastermen. Imagine a world where the Nazis not only won World War II, but went on to direct world culture for the next 60 years with the help of an orphaned alien superweapon known as Overman. But hope is not lost. Rising from the ashes of oppression are a diverse band of heroes raging raging against the fascist regime. 
a band of heroes known as the Freedom Fighters. What nightmarish parallel worlds haunt the dreams of Overman? Who is a mysterious figure called Uncle Sam? And when the dust settles, will the actions of Phantom Lady, Black Condor, Human Bomb, Doll Man, and the Ray be enough to stop Leatherwing, Blitzen, and the other heroes of Earth X? Learn all this and more in this exciting issue that acts as Chapter 7 of the critically acclaimed Multiversity Storyline. Okay, now since Chris has to leave sort of early, well, sort of actually after this is done, let's go through the Bible. I'll have to let him start off first, then, if we could. All right? Good, Mert. Bye, borrow pants, Murd. Oh, oh, bye, without a question. <laughs> well, that's what I figured. <laughs> I give it a bye. A uh, very strong bye with just a slight caveat that I'll explain. Well, why don't you go ahead and explain, sir? Honored. All right, first <laughs> of all, uh, I was really looking forward to reviewing this for two reasons. One, it deals with World War II, which is my historical passion. I, mean, I have many historical passions, but that one's at the top. And two, I was really looking forward to hearing what Murd had to say about this because this is EarthX, correct, Murd? Yeah, uh, right. This is the new yeah, so, multiverses version of yeah. what was EarthX. So I, I was very excited in both cases uh, for those two reasons to read this, and I was not disappointed. Um, I mean, when you open the book and you see Adolf Hitler struggling on the commode to defecate while reading a Golden Age issue of <laughs> Superman that shows Superman punching out Adolf Hitler on the cover, <laughs> I'm in right away. I knew right away. Up, oh, this is my Grant Morrison, <laughs> and. I was not disappointed from there. Um, this, I thought, this was outstanding. I mean, this, this, this will. I mean, it's early in the year, but this will probably be in the running for me for nominations of best single issue of the year, depending on what else comes out. You know, throughout the throughout 2015. Um, first of all, the attention to historical detail was outstanding. Granted, this is an alternate reality, but everything from, you know. Having Werner von Braun, who was actually one of the, the key Nazi scientists to develop their V1 and V2 rocket programs, being the scientist who was, you know, discovering the, the, the truth behind the fact that, you know, Superman's ship has fallen to the Third Reich rather than to Kansas, um, was great. You know, the, the Pina Munde uh, missile complex was actually where the Nazi Germany developed their missile program. Uh, just seeing when the when the when the Overman who was you know Superman were just working for the Nazis. So we've we've had Superman serving Joseph Stalin in this world, but now I'm serving Adolf Hitler. Uh, you know, conquering the United States, and you know you see a German soldier using his Panzer Faust, his uh, rocket launcher, blowing up the Lincoln Memorial, and the German soldiers are pouring you know hoppy beer over its its head, and <laughs> you know this is. The attention to detail here, both historically and also just in terms of these new slants on classic DC characters, which I'm sure Myrtle will speak about with, 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 with a lot of uh, enthusiasm, was really well done. Uh, just seeing Superman's – or Overman as he's called here, his, his – because this takes place over decades, you know, the, from when he's, when he's first discovered as an infant to when he helps Hitler win the war to then Hitler, you assume, is long dead, decades have passed. And Overman, I guess, is you know is, is Führer or leader of, you know, I guess what is the World Reich, and seeing they they allude to the, to the Holocaust and the fact that apparently the Overman was off planet for three years, and he returns, he, he's clearly horrified at what the Nazis have done, and that that clearly is is weighing on him. Um, this was outstanding. The only the only thing I didn't really, and it's not that I didn't like it, I don't think Jim Lee was the right artist for this book. Um, first of all, his Adolf Hitler is, is almost, it's almost like he's a muscular, like man's man, which is, which was the exact antithesis of what Adolf Hitler was actually like physically. That really actually kind of jumped out at me and, and, and actually bothered me as, as I was in those early pages when they show Hitler in the book. Um, and I, I don't know, I just... Considering the characters we were dealing with and just the world we were dealing with, I, I just – the using Jim Lee as the artist just kind of didn't ring true for me. I was just – I was looking for more of, I don't know, maybe a more Golden Age feel or kind of tone or look to these characters or maybe even more of a Bronze Age since you know the Freedom Fighters were, were in the Bronze Age. And so that, that fell a little flat for me, but that, that's a minor point. I mean the, the story is so well done um, and you know Grant Morrison has always has really done his homework. In, in terms of the, the way he interprets the characters, you know, the use of the human bomb, for example, and 
uh, the various historical illusions that are then kind of kind of put on their head a little bit, kind of twist around in this alternate reality. Uh, this, this was this was so much fun to read. I mean, I mean, it's it's a dark story. It's not you know like, hey, I'm clicking my heels because this is this is a, a light subject matter. But uh, it, it was just seeing seeing like you know the the, the Nazi versions of Jimmy Olsen, who I think is called uh, Jurgen in this story, and mm-hmm. this horribly self absorbed uh, uh, Lana Lang type character, who I think is called Lena in this. Um, who's you know just out, outraged that whatever technology Overman has given her, she's she's no longer will soon be able to stay young, um, and just the use of Uncle Sam as sort of this essence of the American spirit that refuses to die, and I love how in, early in the book, as the the, the, the German soldiers are destroying the Lincoln uh, Memorial and, and they're burning books and they're burning Golden Age comics, and uh, they show Uncle Sam you know surreptitiously spiriting away. A Golden Age comic uh, under his under his sort his, his uh, weather beaten jacket uh, in, in the 1950s as America has fallen, and uh, it's 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 a great example of I think what multiversity should be all should be about just taking you know one of these alternate realities that Morrison is, is lovingly borrowing from the established DC multiverse, but then putting his own spin on it as only Grant Morrison can. And uh, I'm, I'm I'm not even doing this justice. There's so many fun little details in this story. Uh, both historically and in terms of the DC multiverse, that are that are just so well done. So, this is a, a very strong buy. And you know, the book is uh, four ninety nine, and it's worth it. it. It's a it's a really good one shot. You know, you don't get many. The, the the art of the one shot, I think, is lost in many in many cases in comics today. But boy, does Morrison still have the ability to tell a great one and done story, as he has with all the multiversity books I've read. So. Strong bar. And, and Pants, I'll definitely stick around because I want to hear what the other gentlemen have to say. Oh, so, certainly. Yeah. Other gentlemen? <laughs> uh, I'll let, there's no way I'm going to do justice to what Murd's going to do Shane, you should really go second because otherwise I won't leave you anything oh. to say. <laughs> well, I, I agree with a lot of what Chris said. I, I myself don't need to see Hitler on the toilet. <laughs> so th- I really could have done without that. <laughs> the next page would have been just fine. But I, I get it, Chris. I, I know why you like it. It's fine. Um I enjoyed it. I, I love the I, I liked some of what Jim Lee did, like the, the picture with Superman's rocket, I thought was was pretty well done. I really did love there's one page a few later where you see Superman in a classic Jim Lee pose from oh god, what the heck was that twelve issue story that came after Hush that Superman. Oh that was Brian in. Azzarello. For yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, for tomorrow. Um and, and it's that picture there. Trying to show Pansy's look. That oh, okay. That panel I love. Some of the other panels, I think, uh, like there's one later where Leatherwing, who's Batman's legs, look too big. Like there is some distortion there, and and I am a fan of Jim Lee, but it just doesn't look right. Um, love the Eagle's Nest, which is the JLA Watchtower. The design of those heroes inside, which is uh, Lightning, is the, is the Flash and Underwater Man and whoever Green Lantern and Red Tornado yeah, and all. I, I don't think they ever tell you the names of them. Not all they of don't. them. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, but I but I but I do like their designs. Um, really love Leatherwing, Batmanish kind of character a lot more than than even Superman to a certain extent. But then again, I also a, like Shane how Leatherwing is a descendant of of Hans von Hammer. Yeah, yeah. Who is the enemy ace now? Now in the D, main DC universe, the enemy ace was was anything but a Nazi. But in this version, of course, they made him a. A hill clicking uh, goose stepper, which is interesting. Um, it, it was it was fun little nod to see like the crisis thing with with Overgirl um, in the one panel just before they flash forward to the present, sixty years later type thing. It, like you said, Chris, it, it's typical Grant Morrison. It was a fun one shot. I'd like to read more. I really, God, I wish they would do more with some of these parallel earths and and make some kind of anthology that visits these every now and then it it aches so badly that we have all this resource out there and they don't touch upon it ever and 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 these little glimpses while fantastic and i'm I'm all in for them they go away then and there's nothing coming out to to see that again uh i was really hoping things that come june and after in dc would would utilize some of this material uh, especially the stuff grant morrison has touched upon with multiversity uh, but yeah, it was it was a lot of fun to read. Uh, it's a little pricey, but I think this is one occasion where four ninety nine. As much as I was railing on that being a price, the last episode I was on, um, 
this really was was worth it in in content reading um it took a while to read it was it was enjoyable to take your time reading it and try to get the nuances there's some stuff that you mentioned chris and i know myrtle mentioned it that i missed um which will be a, an enjoyment to reread it again uh down the road but yeah it, it was a lot of fun to read this and and i'm glad we picked it out like like chris i want to hear what Murd has to say about it okay well <laughs> not surprisingly <laughs> i I, I, I love this issue for, for many of the reasons already mentioned. I mean, starting right here on the cover, you know, talking about establishing a golden age feel, what we've got here is a, a minimally uh, inked and colored uh, – well, it's supposed to be like a facsimile of a, a golden age comic book from uh, the, the Earth-10 timeline of uh, Overman and Uncle Sam arm wrestling each other and, and, and uh, in, contained in this uh, ridiculously ornate, overwrought uh, – frame with uh, the, the the fascist eagle uh, volant right on top of it it's just and that sort of encapsulates visually right there in the front cover you know the uh, the the tendency of uh, history to be written by the victor and uh, for um, you know, a dominant culture to enshrine its past victories and even its past failures and that's kind of what we're seeing going on here and it is uh, definitely a theme of of the earth 10 as a setting and then getting into the story, I'm, <laughs> I understand your concern, Shane, but I, like Chris, am definitely uh, in and, favor of uh, and that's fine. the Hitler Scheisseler. I, I, you know, the, I get it. <laughs> the shitting Hitler on the first page. I, right? I get it. That is probably the, probably the most brilliant detail in the entire thing because talking again about trying to establish a golden age feel here, see, presenting Hitler as uh, semi-ridiculous and buffoonish, that's, that's kind of what golden age comics are oh, all about. Oh, absolutely. And they're definitely doing that here. I mean it's – and you know, to, to the subject of the artwork because I have less to say about that than I do about the story as usual. Um, I definitely understand what you're saying about that, Chris, and uh, I know that uh, – well, Brack on the forums uh, who has been checking into the uh, Atlantic. Last multiversity threat fairly regularly at, uh, on uh, at the comicforums.com to uh, share his thoughts in brief about each multiversity issue as it comes out. Uh, he was uh, uh, unimpressed by Jim Lee's artwork too, with the, you know, assisted as he is by four different inkers throughout the, the course of the issue. Oh, there's four. I thought it was only Scott Williams. No, oh, no, there's a few. If you look at the back, uh, yeah, let's see here. Mm, yeah, Scott Williams, Sandra Hope, Mark Irwin, and Jonathan Galapian. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of inking by committee. Okay, but yeah, and and it, it is. Uh, th- th- there's no question. It's it's not Lee's strongest work, and he is maybe not the best choice to uh, represent a, you know, a, a sort of a golden age derived uh, Nazi dominated world, such as seen in, in this issue. But I will say this: even if uh, his artwork is kind of mediocre here, we need to remember that uh, in the golden age, uh, many of the artists were amateur, untrained. Uh, unseasoned. Uh, well, a lot of them were, were barely out of their teens, or not out it's of true. their teens. Very true. Yep. So, in this case, I think it's kind of fitting that uh, the artwork is well, less than impressive. It's if, if we want to go for a golden age feel, that that's kind of uh, uh, the closest twenty first century approximation you're going to come by. It's uh, you know the mediocrity suits the message. That's my uh, take on that. Uh, now, as to the story itself. Um, it doesn't really live up to the uh, solicitation copy that uh, Brian was reading a little <laughs> no, while no, ago. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, and I think that's actually kind of a good thing. You know, I was going into this, I was, I wasn't so excited about there being Nazi versions of the Justice League in this story, because mm-hmm. you know that was never a part of the old pre-crisis Earth X. Right. Know, the uh, the idea there was that uh, Earth X was a world that uh, well. Well, once Roy Thomas in his All-Star Squadron series got his hands on it, Earth-X was uh, defined as an Earth that had no super beings whatsoever, but uh, on which uh, the tide was turned in favor of the Nazis somewhere along the line. I don't even remember what it was that turned the tide, but it wasn't the arrival of an infant Kal-El in the 30s back in Germany. Um, it was something else, some other major super science development that the Nazis came up with. And then the Freedom Fighters were a bunch of heroes from Earth-2 who were imported to Earth-X to try and uh, you know, take back the Earth after the Nazis had all but won the globe. Um, but here we, we take a slightly different route, and we learn that the reason that the war uh, went in favor of the Nazis in the first place was the arrival of Superman. Uh, well, of, of Kal-El, who became Overman, and he became the Nazis' secret weapon, and that's the whole reason why the Nazis won the war and why the freedom fighters uh, had to come into existence later. And this is not the first time we've seen a Nazi uh, sort of Justice League analog before either. Um, again, Roy Thomas in his Young All-Star series. Uh, that series started right after Crisis on Infinite 
on infinite Earths had wrapped up. And uh, Roy's feeling was, okay, this newborn universe senses that it's been – certain vital organs have been uh, removed from it. And its, strugg- it's uh, immune system, if you will, is struggling to replace these structures with uh, crude homologues. And so he wrote into the Young All-Star series, which was set during World War II, a bunch of uh, super-powered Nazis – who were sort of doppelgangers for the Justice Society members that were written out of the DC continuity with Earth 2. So we had kind of a Nazi version of Superman, Batman and Robin, Wonder Woman, and Aquaman, and even Green Arrow. Uh, so he was uh, – yeah, the, the Green Arrow was actually an Italian fascist rather than a Nazi. But uh, yeah, so you, you got uh, you know, Ubermensch and Gudra the Valkyrie and uh, the Sea Wolf. Uh, so these were all sort of uh, – Roy Thomas's sort of tongue-in-cheek replacements for the uh, missing and uh, very uh, and their, their loss was very deeply felt by Roy Thomas of JSAers that were no longer a part of the DC continuity. So I was afraid that all we were going to be getting here was another version of Axis America, which is what this uh, these characters from the Young All Stars were called, um, and we'd just be seeing them going up against the Freedom Fighters and blah blah blah. But very different take from what I was expecting here. You, know, you do note that the, the title of the issue is not The Freedom Fighters, and it's also not The New Reichsmen, for that matter, which is the name of the Nazi Justice League in here. It's simply called Mastermen, which you might take as you know, the term for metahumans or superhumans on Earth-10, um, or the German equivalent, like the Meistermänner or something like that. Um, I love what he does that. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you. Um, but, but yeah, so it, it's, it's not so much about uh, good guys or bad guys here. It's just about the power struggle that's emerging on this world. I mean it's, uh, it's, it's definitely not about the freedom fighters. They're not the central characters here no, at all. No. It's surprising how few pages in this issue really deal directly with the freedom fighters as characters. I mean almost everything is from the point of view of uh, Overman oh, yeah. or uh, members of uh, his uh, entourage – uh, you know the, the interactions with, uh, as Chris said, his uh, painfully self-absorbed uh, <laughs> bride Lena, and uh, who um, you know, may indeed be. You know, th- th- this is the funny thing here. She's probably intended to be a version of Lana Lang from Earth Ten. That's but, how I took it too. But Lena is a name that's often associated with Lex Luthor in uh-huh. his family, and she is redhead. Oh. So you never know. Maybe she's like some gender swapped, or maybe she's Lex Luthor's brain in a <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in a female yeah. body, and she's into it. That, that's just twisted enough for Grant Morrison to have uh, worked into this. So, or that's a perfect example of why we need you at all times. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I'm I'm here to help. Indeed. Um. So uh, what? Uh, okay. So yeah, it, it's it's largely about uh, Overman and uh, you know his uh, crisis of conscience because even on Earth Ten when he's been raised by Nazis, you know those. Uh, you know, sort of st- that superhuman morality is, is present here. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's he's sort of transcending his upbringing, and he's sort of coming to realize that maybe, just maybe, this glorious global Reich that he has helped to bring into being has been in some ways mistaken all along. And that uh, those few panels Chris mentioned, where uh, uh, we see Overman in the past returning from some mission in space, and uh, he discovers that the Holocaust has gone on while he was gone, and he was never really a part of that. And he is now one of the few people left alive in this new world Reich who even remembers all of that. Well, I'm sure everybody remembers it or is aware that it happened, but he was there to witness the horror firsthand. Everyone else is detached from it. They're, they're younger. It all happened well before they were born. They don't feel any connection to or responsibility for it. And so, uh, so the, his uh, fellow uh, new Reichsmen are all kind of – if ambivalent about it, yeah, the closest thing he has to an ally here is uh, this underwater man, Untavasaman, uh, whose uh, Atlantean uh, ancestors uh, sort of suffered as a result of the Nazis' actions during the uh, protracted uh, World War. Um, but uh, for the most part, uh, the other Nazis are just kind of shrugging. They like things the way that they are. This is the status quo for them. You know, the, the Nazi values have been deeply entrenched. Its you know, history has been rewritten in favor of the victors. Probably the most chilling scene in the whole book for me, actually, is uh, right next to that panel Chris mentioned where Uncle Sam uh, sneaks away and saves that uh, issue of Superman from being burned, which, is, which I agree, Chris, is a great panel. But right next to it, we see this sort of foreboding image of uh, – the obelisk yeah. of the Washington oh, Monument Washington at Monument, sunset. Yeah. With it's, it's just a kind of a still life. There's not much. There's nothing going on in the panel, but it just shows this giant swastika banner draped from it and uh, Nazi flags flying around it, showing us that uh, okay, this is this is just the way of the world now. This is really... the other thing we have to remember. If I may interject for just a moment, of course, Mark, is is another chilling aspect of this is if you read uh, the history and if and if you look into you know the Nazis' twisted ideology, which so much of which was based on this sort of 
ludicrous, a ludicrous uh, sort of sham pseudoscience involving eugenics and uh, you know references to Nietzsche. I mean, Hitler and 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 some of his alkalites, they would talk about you know. You know the Superman, or, or like the, this, this, the, 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 this master man, like these, these, the whole idea of of breeding over time. You know the, this this superior being, and, and the, the 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 SS even had these uh, breeding spas where single women were encouraged to mate with sort of these idealized uh, genetic genetically idealized SS officers, and then their children were uh, then. Uh, taken from them and given to selected German families who were seen as suitable genetically and, and ideologically to raise them as future warriors of the state, and they were actually doing this stuff. I mean, I mean, the average German wasn't involved in this, but this stuff was going on. So, the, the, you know, there's this is a very super well, it's not super heroic, but a, like a super powered extension of 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 their sort of this twisted ideology that. Was being promoted in, in some corners of, of the Nazi state, especially among among the SS. So hmm. Morrison did his homework. Well, I'm sure he did. Well, and, well, thank you very much for the additional historical context, Chris. Sure, you can interrupt me with that any time. <laughs> um, so yeah, so so yeah, it, it's mainly from the the point of view of uh, of Overman and his new Reichsman, and uh, I think that's kind of necessary for the. Uh, uh, so so when Uncle Sam and his freedom fighters finally do appear. You know, we get the same sense of shock and awe that uh, you know the, the citizens of this World Reich would have had seeing them arrive. So they, they've been sort of otherized. You know, they've been rendered as something foreign and alien and threatening. And you know, they're, they're referred to as terrorists by the the, the citizens of this this new uh, not worldwide Nazi empire. Sure. And eventually, we do get a couple of glimpses behind the curtain, and so. Uh, the the the, you know, the the characters uh, advertised as the heroes of the book do get to you know, sort of behave in that way for a couple of pages at least. I, I really liked the scene where we actually get to see a few of them. You know, where we see the Freedom Fighter headquarters. I love that it's on Ellis Island. You know, since <laughs> that's you know last very symbolic. You know, last sure. bastion of uh, the old uh, well the the the, the, the integrationist. Ideals of tolerance and acceptance uh, that uh, uh, were, well, at certain times and in certain quarters, uh, very important in the old uh, pre-Nazi United States. So it, it's it's fitting that the Freedom Fighters chose that as opposed to something like I don't know the Capitol Building or something as as their as their headquarters. And we get to see the Doctor Sivana of Earth Ten. And funnily enough, that was it, great. <laughs> that was a great touch. Yeah, great touch. Yeah, you know, as we learn from you know, looking at all these old uh, Golden Age Captain Marvel comics, uh, he was one of the few villains in the early years of Captain Marvel stories uh, who didn't speak with an exaggerated Nazi accent. You know, he was as much against the Nazis as anybody because uh, no, no matter what universe he's in, Savannah believes he's the rightful ruler of it. So he was as much against the Nazis as Captain Marvel was. And here we have him, and on Earth-10, he does speak with an exaggerated German accent, but he appears to be just as much against the Nazis as he is any place. And he... I can make one more comment because then, sure. unfortunately, I have to depart, gentlemen. But And you were referencing this, Murd. Uh, I think one of the more powerful aspects of the story – was when we get to sixty years later, and you know, you assume Hitler's dead, and, and Overman is is the leader, and you know, he's talking with his his his, the, his teammates and so forth, and sort of this, except for uh, you know, uh, Unter Seemann, this sort of sanitized view they have of their past and of their history, and the fact that you know, the 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 the, the, fr the freedom fighters are seen as terrorists in their eyes, it, it, that's. That strikes a chord because when you look at the history of any nation, you know that's been around a long time and so forth. You always have to wonder the history you're you're being told as a citizen about events that happened long before you were born. Is that really the full story of what went on? And those people have been portrayed as terrorists. Is that really what they are? And I just, I just, I think again, it's, again, Morrison's a tremendous writer. I just think it's very smart to just. Show how, with the passage of time, you have to assume that many of the people living in this Reich, this world empire, probably think it's a good thing, and then they probably see these 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 murderers who are working with Overman essentially as as these heroic figures who are protecting their way of life. It's just an unsettling reminder of how so much of history, and even of current events, really, is so much based on perspective and mm. where you're sta where you're who shoes you're in. As you're observing these events, because obviously as the reader, we know exactly what the Nazis are about. We know exactly what Hitler was about, and obviously we want the freedom fighters to prevail, and you assume by the end of the story that eventually that's going to happen in some form. 
But it's it just it, – it, I thought it was in, in, in a kind of an underplayed way one of the most chilling aspects of this entire story. Um, and it just – you know, if you look if – you, if you live in the United States, if you go talk to Filipinos who – and their view of the United States for what we did there in 1900 or you know, American Indians or mm-hmm. you go to any country. I'm not picking on us. Just anywhere that, that, where, the, where you're talking about a world power, there's going to be different perspectives. And I, I, just, I just think it's very smart that Morrison put that in there like that. Sure. Well so, said, Chris. Yes. And gentlemen, I'm sorry I must depart. But oh, thank you so is such much. sweet sorrow. Oh, Take care. <laughs> Thanks, pantaloons. But I will talk to you all in a few days and we'll, no doubt we'll be discussing a certain television program. Absolutely. So, Sounds good. Take care, brothers. Good night. Right. Good night, Chris. Bye. 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 Uh, yeah. So I am. I am glad Chris mentioned uh, American Indians because I was going to say, you know, just picture um, if uh, like an undercurrent or uh, like a, a secret underground of American Indians uh, s- uh, suddenly started uh, bombing major cities and tried to kick all of us, you know, of European descent out of uh, their land. Yeah. You know, how how would we respond to that? I mean, would we consider them villains and terrorists? Um, or would we gradually come to the realization that they might just have a point? So you see that there's some ambiguity going on here, and uh, you know, the overman's perspective helps to you know, bring that across. And I was happy, though, to see that we a little bit of the, of the Freedom Fighters, you know, the characters we've come to know as the Freedom Fighters revealed here, sort of slight, subtly recast as uh, uh, being genetically engineered by Herr Dr. Sivana from uh, survivors of the uh, groups that the Nazis persecuted. So mm-hmm. we've got uh, Doll Man as a Jehovah's Witness, which I thought was kind of brilliant. Uh, Phantom Lady, apparently a gypsy. Uh, the Black Condor being black both figuratively and literally. And I, I suppose we can... The Ray is probably going to be Jewish then, and so we're not really told. But you know, that that was a pretty ingenious touch. And all of them seem to have adopted, you know, the, the Freedom Fighters symbol appears to be triangles. You notice that? They all seem to have triangles incorporated into their costume designs. And uh, the last time we see Uncle Sam when he does these, I love when Uncle Sam does these enormous Hologram, holographic projections yeah. of himself. The first time we see him, he like this, this giant head saying, Overman, we dare, we the people. That was Awesome, very, very impactful. And again, if we'd, if this were being told from the point of view of the freedom fighters rather than of the the, the, the New Reichsmen or the citizens of the New Reich, uh, that would not have had the same impact. But if you look at Uncle Sam's lapel when he last appears, there is sort of a little pink triangle there on his yeah. lapel. And I do wonder because pink triangles uh, were the uh, symbol assigned by the uh, well, the the, the Nazis uh, in World War II to homosexuals, another group that they persecuted. Hmm. So okay. interesting that they've uh, – the freedom fighters have embraced that as the symbol for their organization. You're starting to say something, Chris? Uh, Shane? <laughs> I was, well, I was thinking if, if it also – because they're on Ellis Island and, and what they represent, is there any Masonic value to the triangle symbol, especially on what would be Phantom Lady's belt there with other little triangles around it? Hmm. it just something that caught my eye. I, I don't know that much about – Masons or history or anything like mm. that in that way. It was just a thought. I suppose it's possible. Kind of like that, uh, the pyramid with the eye on top. That yeah, was, yeah. That figured on the back of the dollar for mm-hmm. such a so long, long time. time. Yeah, it's a possibility. But most of them have the triangle upside down on their costume everywhere. Right. right. She's the only one that really has it upright on her belt. Yep. And it's upside down on her pendant then. So. Yeah, yeah, it is. Interesting stuff. So, yeah, this, this, this entire comic is just a it, – it's a well-told story. It plays with uh, the Parallel Earth concept. It gives us a glimpse into you know, what uh, the Justice League would be like if they uh, came into being in a world dominated by uh, well, fascist values you know, and uh, showing how those fascist values might evolve or, or degenerate, if you will, over 60 years as the dominant ideology of Earth. Uh, the Nazi redesigns of the various costumes are actually kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I thought the, that was well done. Yeah, the nameless Nazi Hal Jordan is actually my favorite of the lot. Um, and, well, it's what, what you said a little while ago, Shane, about uh, how you, you really hope that these worlds are revisited. Yeah. I think this story, probably more than any other multiversity one-shot we've seen, cries out to be uh, revisited and developed even further. I mean, there, there, there are threads left dangling here, doors oh, left sure. open. I mean, it's, this is just the beginning. It, it tells us right here, the, the very last caption of the whole thing, that day was only the beginning. Yeah. And even the, the running narrative of, uh, of J- J- Jürgen Olsen. 
uh, who, who says that eventually he goes on to betray the new Reichsman, but we never learn how in this story. And we've barely seen a glimpse of the new of the freedom fighters. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of stuff that can still be done with this with this Earth Ten, and I'm I'm sure that eventually it might just be like a, a Justice League crossover. I, I could see Jeff Johns like uh, milking a Justice League arc out of uh, the Earth Ten concept because that's, that's fine. I'll take anything I can get. That's how the freedom fighters on Earth X won their you know badly protracted uh, World War Two, and that could be how these freedom fighters win it too with the help of the Justice League. So yes, definite buy for me. All right, wow, that was fun. See, that was worth. That <laughs> yes, was, it worth, was worth quickly going. Ah, ah you can't escape. And this is how you repay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I you, defy you. You you do kind of screw Murd when he's doing a, a good rant and then <laughs> boom, <laughs> right with the muddle. <laughs> muddle the Murd. <sighs> All right. Well, this muddle the Murd is brought to you by, or right, brought to you by. Uh, sent to us by <laughs> sent to us by Joe Camp from Wilmington, Delaware, who probably was a man we met at the uh, comic book shop down there. I would, I would, I would like imagine him. his, his name, name was Joe. His name was Joe. So once again, uh, up for grabs in this episode. If you happen to muddle the bird, is a Chris Samney Superman sketch. And we're going to jump right into this right here now. Jump. Question one. Well, first of all, I'm sorry. He says, "Hi, geeks. Long time listener. First time emailing." First off, thanks go to all of you for the endless hours of entertainment and incalculable knowledge that you have bestowed. Incalculable. I, like <laughs> uh, I thought I would take a stab at cutting down Murd in his world tri- in his world famous trivia contest. Hopefully, he has sharpened his blade mind and is ready. Question number one: DC Post Two Thousand. What is the name of the sister sword to the salvation sword as seen in Azrael? Hmm. <laughs> wow. Yep, no idea whatsoever. Um, wow. So let's see, the salvation sword. Um, well, the opposite of that would be the damnation sword, probably. But, you know, I'm going to say the retribution sword. The sword of sin. Nope. <laughs> I guess my question is... You know which volume of Azrael that was. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure post-2000. Well, for now, we'll let it go for now. We'll have to get the judges to examine this later on then. <laughs> go look at the video yeah, tape. It, it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I got the question wrong. And knowing... Even if it turns out it's from the 90s or something, it, it, it wouldn't have made me get the answer any less wrong. That's so. very big of you, sir. <laughs> question two. Independent 1970 to 2000. What was the name of Lady Death's first sword? Wow. Shiny. Well, <laughs> uh, the Memorizer. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, yeah, I, 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 I've read very few Lady Death comics in my life. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. The answer is darkness. Why not? Darkness. Okay. No parents? Kind of makes it better? No. <laughs> okay, so that leaves us with Marvel prior to 1970. That's correct. Avengers issue number 48 was the first appearance of the sword-carrying Black Knight. Which artist drew the cover for that issue? Oh, my Lord. <sighs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think you got me here, Joe. Because, yeah, I, I, I really don't – I'm not sure I'd even be able to tell you who drew the interiors of that issue, let alone, let alone who did the cover. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike Sikowski. George Tuska, or Tuska, January 1968. All right. All right. Well, nice. I am forwarding this email to Mr. Adam Murdo. He will take care of getting you your Chris – Somni Superman sketch. Very good, Joe. Yes, well played, well played. And I'm more than happy to mail a prize to Wilmington. <laughs> <laughs> or just do a drive-by, just drop it like a, like a, like a paper boy, just put on his lawn. <laughs> extra, extra. <laughs> That's true. Wilmington does lie on my family's route to Stone it Harbor. sure so. does. As we learned just not too short long ago. Not too short long ago. I'm going to shut up now and yep. get on to the – well, not, I can't – I have to read the introduction here. Oh, oh, or the 
Man, oh, man. Ooh. Go for pants. Go for pants. <laughs> All right. Up next from Image Comics, <laughs> Secret Identities Number 1, story by Brian Joins. I'm pretty sure. Okay. And Jay Ferber, art and cover by Ilias Curiosis. Curiosis. And some guy named Charlie Kirkoff. We know Charlie. It says here, the supergroup known as the Front Line have just invented new hero Crosswind to join them. Or they invited him <laughs> to join them. But what they don't know is that Crosswind is a mole sent to learn all their secrets. And the Front Line have lots of secrets. Gentlemen, buy borrow pants. An enthusiastic buy. Oh. I'd give it a borrow. Not so enthusiastic. But... <laughs> enthusiastic enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Bert. All right. Yeah, this this was the sleeper hit of the month for me. Because um yeah, I'm not sure how we arrived at the decision to buy it, but well to well to choose it as an off the rack selection. I think I think I remember the... I thought you did. It, it may be that I did. I was just kind of curious about it. I had yeah. it marked as a maybe in my previews catalog, and I just wanted a, an excuse to pick it up and give it a try. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think this was the episode that uh, I had to do from uh, well, from the remote location, mm-hmm. remember, because I was I was sick that, that evening. Um, but, yeah, um, but I'm, I'm very glad that we uh, decided to do this because I enjoyed this book quite a bit. Um, yeah, it, uh, now this is not the first time we've done an off the rack selection written by Brian Joins, by the way, because, uh, um, yeah, I, I first knew of his uh, work from that, uh, the self published Seven Guys of Justice, which came out uh, long about uh, the end of the last millennium, uh, which was kind of, it was a superhero parody thing and, uh, like a humor based series. And, uh, then, uh, he did, uh, Imagine Agents, okay. also oh, for right. Image, and you remember that was an yes, off the rack selection. I remember Jamie was a lot more impressed by it than I was. It just kind of honestly left me a little bit cold, but uh, not so this offering. Uh, yes, this, and, and you, maybe maybe it's the benefit of the uh, additional talent of uh, Jay Ferber, uh, but this is just a good, solid uh, meat and potatoes, uh, like Copper Age style uh, super team storytelling going on here. Uh, so it's a uh, it's a group of heroes. Um, not that easy to nail down as uh, just just basic analogs to, uh, you, know, you know, is there a Superman figure? Is there a Batman figure? And so on. There, there are a couple of those. There's definitely a speedster for the mm-hmm. Flash, and uh, the the brown recluse is kind of like the Batman. Uh, but for the most part, the the, the characters are a little. Uh, they're, they're more original and more interesting than you might think. These aren't just a bunch of Justice League or Avengers clones, and. Uh, and the, the basic premise is really kind of interesting. I mean, it's it's uh, kind of a twist on kind of the standard superhero team meet cute. You know, the the, the convention or the gimmick that uh, uh, was often used in uh, days of yore to introduce a new member to a, a, an established super team. Um, and so, and it takes that and uh, it asks the question: What if um, someone of uh, of uh, ill intent exploited? Uh, Super Team's propensity to just invite any random uh, seeming crime fighter who shows up at the scenes of their battles to help them to join their ranks. What if somebody uh, used that propensity of Super Team's against them? Um, And so that's exactly what happens here. We know from the outset that this uh, crosswind character uh, is a 'er ne'er-do-well, that uh, he has an axe to grind against the team, and that he's, um, he's infiltrating them. Uh, what we don't know is who's putting him up to it, and the big reveal on the last page comes as a bit of a pleasant as a, of a surprise. Yeah, I didn't see it coming. No, I didn't either. Um, but we know from the outset that uh, you know who, that the crosswind is a bad guy, a bad seed, and he's uh, he's got uh, no good in mind for the the, the front line. Uh, so it's kind of like dial M for murder, right? You know from the beginning who done it and why and how, and it, it's just uh, the, the only real mystery is how the would be victims are going to figure it out and if they can do so in time. Um, so there's that's it's a, it's a suspenseful setup, and uh, you know Ferber was the right choice to help uh, bring this uh, to, to, into reality because uh, he he's done something like this, uh, you know, playing with this same old super team convention back at, during his run on the Titans from the early 2000s. He introduced a character uh, named Epsilon who had uh, not entirely wholesome intentions and was trying very hard, making a strong bid to, for Titans membership. And so we've got uh, Ferber uh, helping Crosswind weasel his way into the front line, uh, uh, but uh, with a lot more success. 
Um, so the fight scenes are well done here uh, between you – know, we, we got a little bit of action in this issue. The big fight against uh, – uh, what, what, what's the demon lord's name again? Perdition. There we go. Who <laughs> looks a little bit like Alan Moore. You squint at him properly. Um, so it's, it's a pretty well-created villain there. And uh, but once uh, once Crosswind is in though, then we get uh, – once that uh, hurdle is cleared, we get several pages. Like most of the issue is taken up with uh, little two-page vignettes, you know, two pages for each of the uh, existing members of this frontline team where we get uh, an idea of, of, of their backgrounds and what uh, skeletons they may be hiding in their various closets. So we've got Luminary, who is the daughter of a, an African-American president of the United States. Uh, and so all the uh, – Interesting little character foibles and challenges that go along with that. She seems to be uh, the one member of, you know, funnily, since she lives her life in the public eye, she's probably the one member of the front line with the least to hide. But there's still going to be some interesting uh, drama going on in her background because um, her father's, uh, well, well the, the chief of the NSA is uh, pushing her to, uh, well, sort of become a spy for the United States interest in this front line super team whose yeah. headquarters is in Canada. You know, so you know, not to bury the lead there for our Canadian listeners, but yes, uh, Toronto is the home of the front line. They're they're not an American or a Canadian superhero team specifically, but uh, you know, so this whole the fact that uh, the daughter of the chief executive officer of the United States is a member of this team headquartered you know, in Canada. That's going to make the fact that the team is headquartered in Canada probably a lot a much more central detail here than it is in uh, Jeff Lemire's Justice League United series yeah. which is also about a super team headquartered in Canada then we've got a super speedster who is two timing his wife he's raising two families on two coasts the the recluse is um, sort of a pulp styled uh, vigilante with a very dark secret his own unique way of uh, well uh, solving the prison population problem uh, Gai Jin is sort of a, a bushido master superhero whose uh, adoptive brother is a, a gangster punchline is a, well, she's sort of like sort of like a Spider Man meets Ellen DeGeneres you know she's a struggling stand up comic uh, who also uh, beats up bad guys on the side and. She seems like a very interesting character, though we don't see uh, much in the way of uh, dark secrets as far as she goes. Vesuvius, who is a volcanically powered uh, – apparently he was a Roman soldier back in the days of the you – know, who was caught in the eruption of Pompeii, of, of Vesuvius, well, well, the, the volcano from which he takes his name, and was buried by the ash and the lava and so forth. And uh, he emerges from this uh, you know, centuries later with volcanic powers and supposedly no memory of his past, or does he? Helot, who is uh, – a uh, resident of uh, a colony called New Thermopylae, which I think is kind of like a Nova Roma from the Marvel Universe, uh, where um, well, the character Magma of the New Mutants, uh, she had volcanic superpowers, and uh, she was a mutant born in a colony called Nova Roma, which is like this iso isolationist colony uh, which lived its life and conducted its business as if uh, ancient Rome had never fallen. Um, so uh, 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 Helot is kind of the same thing except he comes from a, a bastion of ancient Greek culture and he's got superpowers and apparently he was programmed to uh, – mentally programmed to attack and be a, a soldier of New Thermopylae. And, but he was deprogrammed and now fights for the front line. So we get these little glimpses into these characters. So in, in just a, a few pages here, we get what would be like maybe five or ten years worth of, uh, of character development and backstory uh, unfolding across uh, – Five or six different uh, solo series, you know, the member you know, the series belonging to the members of a super team like the Avengers of the Justice League, and it's all packed into a few pages. We're introduced to the headquarters of the front line, which is really quite interesting. Yeah. They they work out of the the rotting corpse of this uh, huge alien warrior thing. It's kind of frozen in place with its sword arm lifted aloft. Apparently, the front line defeated it in their first. Uh, mission together as a team and uh, it then became loyal to them and allowed them to live inside its body and there's all these little they call them bugs uh, uh, sort of like the uh, immune system or nervous system of the giant that uh, are act as uh, the uh, the major domos the the, the, the domestic staff that uh, maintain the headquarters and uh, help the uh, front line out so you've got the basic uh, premise uh, Outline for us in in some nice detail in this first issue. Um, lots of really pithy, juicy, uh, character-centric uh, intrigue going on here. Lots of subplots, lots of 
you know, dirty laundry that uh, eventually that we're, we're all just uh, tingling with anticipation to see how it's going to get aired out eventually. You know, to see what uh, Crosswind and his uh, mysterious handler. Um, are going to do to uh, to bring the front line to their knees. Um, so it's, it's just generally the, 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 this just this is a well done first issue. It reaches out and grabs you by the throat. It shows you that there's going to be a lot going on. That there are a lot of ideas going through the heads of the writers. Um, the artwork, you know, by a by a Greek newcomer, Ilias Kiriazis, is is very very nice, very clean, very detailed. It's good, wholesome superhero art. And uh, you know the the peppy primary palette employed by our pal Charlie. Damn it, Charlie. Why can't your name begin with a P? You're messing with my game here, Charlie. But it's, he's only going to be the colorist for this first issue. But he did a, a damn fine job in this issue. It's nice and bright. The colors pop. You know, it's – this. as I've said, this is Copper Age-style super team adventure. So, you know, if you remember and have fond memories of, say, like Roger Stern's Avengers or Jerry Conway's Justice League, um, I would uh, strongly encourage you to get out there and try Secret Identities. I mean, it's going to be like a homecoming for you, I get the feeling. And uh, specifically, I'm going to call – Call out one listener, Eric Bennett, Thorell on the forums, since you did us the good term of introducing us to the adventures of John Amon, the Amazing Man, which is an independently published book um, using nice clean art and bright colors featuring uh, little, uh, public domain Golden Age characters. I'm going to do you a solid two and tell you you should really try Secret Identities if you haven't already, Eric, because something tells me it will be to your taste. So definite buy for me. It's a very pleasant surprise. I wasn't sure I would like it as much as I turned out to, and I will definitely be buying Buying future issues of this and reading it month to month. Murd, that was fantastic. <laughs> There's just no way to hold 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 uh, hold up to your explanations. Um, I did enjoy the issue. Um, I don't know that it's something that I will get monthly. I would look f- to get this more in a trade format for myself. Um, just my personal taste in some of the non-mainstream type books and, and the way I'm changing my buying and reading habits, I guess a little bit influenced me while I was reading this. Um, I like the big battle scene in the beginning. I love the uh, little vignettes of each hero to get a little bit of an origin of all of all the existing members. Um, I did think the headquarters was very cool. And the fact that it was where they all first battled and defeated their first foe I kind of thought that was cool. It was a neat way to to decide where your headquarters is going to be. Um, I really get kind of annoyed at the uh, the NSA agent. Um, I can see why uh, what's her name would get so ticked off about that. Yeah, it's basically, super Sasha Obama. Yeah, yeah. Luminary is her name yeah. in the book. Um, but yeah, I agree. She, the, the NSA agent was a little out of line. I liked all the little secrets that you learned, so that everybody does have sort of something that that they don't want known to everybody. Um, and I like the reveal at the end. It, it was a surprise. I wasn't thinking that he would even be considered to be the, the big baddie behind everything. Uh, I was I just was thinking in a different way that this guy had some kind of axe to grind that we wouldn't learn yet. Yeah, maybe he's an agent of this universe's Doctor Doom or whatever. But, yeah. But not so. Um, I like the little uh, – the little – creatures that live inside the headquarters and take care of it maintain it that's that's kind of a neat little uh little sidebar so uh they're always going to be there and, and interact with the heroes i imagine and probably help at some point in some way um it can't be just in there as background for keeping the headquarters uh running there's got to be something they're going to do that is more grand i would think no sure we wouldn't have been introduced to them otherwise yeah um i really love the recluse that Again, going with pulpy, vigilante type, I thought um, Phantom, Shadow, uh, even um, Dr. Fate, the way his uh, house is set up. Oh, right, with all the old artifacts. Yeah, all over the place. Um, and then his little secret going down to the to the basement, uh, the way he kind of freaked out on his wife a little bit and then kind of reined it back in, explaining it away. And she was like, no, no, it's okay. I, I understand. Totally didn't expect to see what what they were going to do when they get down there. <laughs> That's probably the my favorite of the dark secrets. Yeah, boy, oh boy. Um, the the second favorite was the, was the the speedster having two families on each coast. Not not that I condone it, but boy, I, I don't know that I would have thought of that. I, I guess if anybody could do that, it would be a speedster mm-hmm. zipping back and <laughs> forth and and explaining it away in the way he did. Um, so yeah, I did enjoy it. I thought the art myself was a little bit off. In places, a, a lot of the characters' faces on pages didn't just look quite right to me. 
wasn't wasn't bad. The coloring was outstanding, nice and like you said, popped and very uh, 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 vibrant, very alive for the book. Um, it it certainly doesn't hurt that it's it's three fifty rather than three ninety nine, a little bit more than two ninety nine, but still it, it's in the middle, so that's a good place to be price wise. Um, doesn't hurt that it's a superhero team. I was uh, pleasantly relieved that it wasn't just going to be whatever they were doing's version of the Avengers or the Justice League. That there, yeah, there's a speedster, yeah, there's this, but these other guys, they're all kind of different, and, and they're just heroes in this world. So I, I enjoyed that quite a bit. It, it's just me, my personal taste, and and I, I didn't do a good job of reading this with a more open mind of just the everyday person reading it. I read it to my specific tastes and I would definitely look at picking this up back issues or me with the way I am. I'd pick this up in a trade or hardback first and read arc by arc. Um, I think I'd get a kick out of uh, the ongoing story and enjoying it, enjoy it that way much more than issue by issue. Mm. Well, I'll tell you if every cliffhanger is as good as the one to this issue, I mean, I think you might be, (laughs) you might be doing the right thing there. Yeah. Just uh, getting to read five or so issues at a at a shot in a trade, but it's definitely a solid book. It and and I borrow it because I'd rather have it in a trade. But it's certainly worth taking a look at uh, if you like group superhero books. If you want something a little bit different, a little bit familiar in that it is a group of superheroes coming together, a uh, little bit of familiarity with some superhero being a, a mole to do something wrong to them, um, yet still be different enough that it's not like any other. Iteration of Justice League, Avengers, Fantastic Four, and all the other groups that we've read over the years. New Teen Titans. Yeah. New Teen Titans. Got to throw that yeah. out there too because they – I think uh, Brian Joins in his little uh, authorial essay at the end mentions uh, the Judas Contract yeah. as a major inspiration for what's happening here. So yeah, def- definitely worth a, le- uh, a read. Glad we did it and I'll, I'll look for the trade when it's solicited for the first arc. All right. Um, so that'll take care of this month's uh, – well, actually, I'm sorry. The previous month's, the previous month's <laughs> off-the-rack choices. Uh, the ones for this month that mm-hmm. we we'll, should get to shortly are Castaways number one, mm-hmm. Chrononauts number one, mm-hmm. and Howard the Duck number one. Now, Howard we also chose – <laughs> we also chose um, Convergence. Zero. Zero. Correct. Which, because it came out a little bit late, we're actually going to – Again, the working theory is we're going to have that as part of a convergence, like month one yeah. episode between you two guys. As you guys have bought the bundles, mm-hmm. once yep. you once you get them, so hopefully sometime early May, we'll have that discussion then. And uh, early May, early May. Early May. Well, I sent you the email. You have to look at your email yeah. because you'll get your shipment in early May. Yeah, but I won't get through all those issues. But yeah, that's why I gave you time, a yeah. date, and as a, as a, and you didn't answer my email. Shane. I didn't. I answer my emails. I know. I've, I know. Hey, look, I'm not. I was flippy this remember, week. Remember, I'm easy going. Relaxed pants fit. Now. Oh, you you are fit. The, this week was actually my fault. I had a I had a really shitty week. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> anyway, so, so no no worries, no worries. That's cool though. Anything else that you guys have read recently you want to chat about? Because uh, mm. have a little bit of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shane, did you read that uh, Irish comic that I brought back? No, it's on my table, aside of the um, aside of the chair that I read in. And uh, what did I try to read? I tried to start to read uh, Infinity Gauntlet, mm. and I was reading a little bit of a book, which then I put it down. I didn't get any very far. How dare you read a book? Think, I, I had my <laughs> iPad out, and I was reading. <laughs> With books. more words oh, than oh, pictures. I was, I was catching up on Earth 2 is what I was uh, – mm. the whole story. Good idea because it figures largely into convergence. OK. Good. Good to know um, because I didn't know that. <laughs> reading, reading up to just before the um, – Earth 2 World's End. Is that what it was called? The weekly yeah. series? So I have all of that to read as well. But I was cranking out Earth 2 issues that I was right. woefully behind on. Yeah, Convergence number one pretty much picks up where Earth 2 World's End ends. Okay. All right. Something to strive for. All right. If that's it, then we'll wrap this episode up. Wrap it up. Yeah. So wrap we'll talk up. about that Irish comic another time. Yeah. But yeah. I'll try to get to that this week right. so we get it in the next uh off the racks and this episode once again was brought to you by get ready shane i know i'm <laughs> was brought to you by superhero stuff.com and go to for all of your superhero, superhero stuff. stuff stuff and also stuff. brought to you by script go to script.com slash comic geek speak right now to get your free 30-day trial 
Visit us at comicgeekspeak.com to send us an email. The address is comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. To leave a voicemail, the number is 267-702-6642. Stop by The Comic Forums and comment on this episode and all the other threads. I also want to say thanks to everyone who's been commenting on the um, Comic Talk. It was a Comic Talk episode. Yes, 1548. Where I talked about what I was going to do and the pricing and all that. It's been a very interesting thread. Very well done. I uh, commented once or twice on it, but I, I've really been enjoying following that thread. So thank you. Well, thank you, Shane, for introducing the topic. That was that was that was a good topic. I I enjoyed that one. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. We would like to thank everyone who contributes. Please throw uh, send us some throw us send us some muddle the merd so pants can surprise merd when every damn well pleases. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time.